people tired for yesterday. We had a, a nice reception and it was an opportunity to start getting to know each other. And I would like to, to welcome our panelists today. Uh, we are starting with a session from the European region of the United Nations, and they are going to provide us some examples and some interesting experiences in relation to how to implement the Sustainable Development Goals for Water in the European Union, and well, in the, in the, Euro the pan-European uh, region. Uh, I would like to, to give the floor to our chair so that she can start to, with this session. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Josefina. Good morning. Uh, buenos dias. Uh, uh, we are very happy to have you here in the morning, although it's uh, very early, but uh, we are looking forward to interesting uh, presentations and to interesting discussions. Uh, my name is Natalia Nikiforova. I work for the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, particularly for the Sec Secretariat of the Water Convention. And uh, I'm here accompanied today by our distinguished uh, panelists, uh, who I will be introducing to you later. Uh, and uh, just to start with a very brief uh, overview of the session. Mm, since uh, it's a morning session and today we are talking about uh, sustainable development goals, I thought it would be useful to give a little bit of an overview of the process of uh, shaping the post-2015 development agenda and to, to discuss a little bit about the means of implementation and uh, the possible tools to implement the water-related uh, sustainable development goals. So uh, this process of uh, shaping the post-2015 development agenda has started uh, uh, not so long ago. It was in 2012 and uh, it's really impressive uh, the progress that has been made in this uh, two or two and a half years. Uh, it was also an unprecedented uh, process because uh, people from all over the world uh, and uh, representatives of all sectors could be involved in uh, in the negotiations. Uh, so there were uh, different streams for uh, global consultations uh, of uh, young people or of uh, interested people who could uh, contribute to the, um, to the discussions through web-based platforms and also different conferences that were organized. Uh, there were also uh, different high-level panels, uh, high-level panels on, of eminent persons and on sustainable development who also contributed to the process, but also uh, academia, business, through the UN Global Compact, uh, the regional commissions, including uh, the UNEC, provided their inputs too. And there were many other, many other inputs who all uh, fed this process. Uh, most importantly, there was also the Open Working Group on Sustainable Development of the General Assembly of the United Nations, uh, who were uh, co deliberating and uh, shaping uh, a set of sustainable uh, de development goals. And finally, uh, just recently, uh, they presented um, 17 goals uh, with 169 related uh, uh, targets, and now they're in process of developing the indicators. Uh, we are very happy also as a uh, water people uh, to know that uh, this time uh, there is a dedicated water goal, which is uh, goal number six, which is to ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. But of course, uh, you know, water is a cross-cutting issue, so many other uh, sustainable development goals also contribute to the water goal, and we shouldn't forget about it. Uh, however, it is important uh, in future deliberations that this water goal stays and uh, that, it is, that there is a dedicated water goal, including all aspects of the water cycle and including transboundary aspects. So that is what we are also um, working on at the UNEC and with uh, many of our partners. Uh, that just in order to frame better uh, this agenda and not to have 17 goals which are you know difficult to remember and difficult to deliver and to communicate uh, the um, general assembly and also the secretary general in uh, in their synthesis report came up with a uh, set of six elements uh, which will be the essential elements for delivering the sustainable development goals and they will be communicated in this way to the country level so it's about dignity, prosperity, justice, partnership, planet, and people. So we have to think about these dimensions uh, when we think about the whole set of, uh, of the SDGs. Uh, what is the way forward? Uh, this year is really the crucial year, and we are in the beginning of this year. So it's important to realize that this year is really a year for global action. 
uh, the, the proposal that was adopted by the General Assembly and also supported by the Secretary General of the United Nations, as I said, includes 17 goals, uh, and we hope that uh, they will all stay there. Uh, but uh, this agenda can still be shaped, uh, it can be shifted, can be combined. So the deliberations are uh, really starting now, and it is very important uh, until September this year uh, how the member states will influence this process. And there will be three major events uh, this year. One will be about uh, um, financing for sustainable development, so discussing the re really means of implementation in July in Addis Abeba. Uh, there will be another uh, event of the General Assembly where the set of uh, SDGs will be adopted, and uh, the year will end with a, um, with a conference of the United Nations Framework Convention for the Climate Change in December. Um, of course, it is good to adopt already a set of, uh, of SDGs, but it's also important to focus on, uh, on their implementation and to mobilize means for implementation. And I think this is really the focus of uh, this conference uh, here today and in the coming days. So we will be discussing the legal frameworks, the financing, capacity building and the technology which we need to, to really uh, successfully implement uh, the SDGs. We also have to think about uh, data collection and access to data and uh, monitoring, evaluation and reporting uh, in terms of uh, SDGs. And we have to also make sure that the monitoring systems are simple and uh, uh, we don't uh, overburden the member states and we don't discourage them in this way from implementing the SDGs. In the uh, UNIC region, of course, we, we welcome uh, the Sustainable Development Goals and we hope that they will further contribute to, to the progress that we are making in, in the UNIC region. And uh, as you said, uh, uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, uh, it is one of the regional commissions of, of the United Nations and uh, it is a commission for Europe. But what is really Europe? Uh, Europe is not only European Union. Uh, it includes uh, Central Asia and all of post post Soviet states. So of course, the level of development uh, really varies in the region, and also the UNEC region particularly includes uh, US, uh, USA, Canada, and Israel. So as you can see, it's a, it's a very wide uh, region, and we all um, exchange experience and uh, work together. So it's not only about the European Union. Also, unfortunately, Europe has not been uh, such a peaceful continent, uh, and we know that there've been, there've been uh, major conflicts and even now like there are tensions uh, in the region. It is also not a water-free uh, problem uh, continent, uh, so almost uh, half uh, of the population lives in water-stressed areas and uh, uh, with the climate change, uh, climate change related extreme weather events will also increase. So we also face many challenges like all the other regions of the world. And in terms of economic development, uh, it is also sometimes shocking to see that uh, uh, so the GDP of some countries in the region can be compared to GDP of uh, other countries in Africa, for example, like the poorest country of, uh, of the European region, which is Tajikistan. Uh, the GDP can be lower than many of the uh, African countries. And it's also the GDP is 100 uh, times uh, less than the richest country, which is Luxembourg. Yeah. So it's really um, a region where we also need uh, a lot of progress still to make. Uh, in terms of challenges, I also think they are not, no different from, uh, from the challenges faced by the world in general. So it's uh, population growth, competing users, uh, and even economic development, as I already said, disparities in access to, to basic services, uh, lack of capacity at the uh, national uh, level, uh, collecting and monitoring data is also a challenge, and uh, having a harmonized set of data is, has been a challenge as well. And of course, we, we will be more and more facing uh, disaster risks and conflicts over water resources. Uh, there are also some good tools, uh, and these are the ones that will be presented uh, partly by, by my colleagues. Uh, so I think it's the most important is to have a, a very solid uh, institutional and legal cooperation frameworks. Uh, the Nexus approach uh, has been also very promising in, uh, in solving these challenges in an integrated manner. Integrated water resources management, which is not a new concept, but still a lot has to be done to implement it in, uh, in the region. Uh, and uh, also this link between environment and human rights uh, has been very important. And uh, for example, the human right to water and sanitation uh, was very helpful in promoting uh, access to water and sanitation for all. 
Uh, and of course, as I said, uh, for the implementation of SDGs, particularly, we, will, we would need uh, harmonized systems for reporting and for monitoring of SDGs. And uh, some uh, platforms already existing at the UNEC level uh, will be, hopefully, will be helpful in this regard. So I, I don't want to, I would, I would prefer to give floor to our <laughs> panelists uh, who are really experts in uh, many of these fields. And uh, we will start with uh, Mina Hanski, who is a ministerial advisor in the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of Finland. And she's also an expert on uh, bilateral cooperation, particularly the Finnish-Russian Commission. So Mina will talk a little bit about the uh, UNEC Water Convention and how the Convention and the Finnish-Russian Commission have influenced each other. Uh, and we have to keep in mind that this Finnish-Russian Commission, it's uh, more than 50 years, so it's really there is a lot of experience there. Thank you very much, and I hope that you will have lots of questions to our participants. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Uh, <coughs> This UNEC Water Convention, so the Convention on the Protection and Use of Transboundary Water Courses and International Lakes, came in force in 1996. So we have uh, 20 years of experience in its application. And almost all countries sharing transboundary waters uh, on UNEC region uh, have retired, have, have ratified, have ratified it. And, uh, and uh, the convention is also complemented by two protocols. Uh, protocol on water and health is very important if we think about sustainable development goals. So uh, it uh, should be noticed that uh, it was the first international agreement focusing on adequate supply of safe drinking water and adequate sanitation for everyone. Uh, water Convention uh, is based on principle of international water law. Uh, it is focused on prevention of adverse trans transboundary impacts such as uh, flooding and pollution. Um, the Water Convention supports countries uh, in concluding agreements on shared waters. And I think very many concrete results has already been achieved. What the convention works also in, uh, in polit politically difficult regions and basins. Uh, quite early uh, parties of the convention realized that there would be uh, uh, many advantages uh, to uh, cooperate uh, also in the wider area. So. Um, in 2003, an amendment was made to, um, to uh, um, uh, make this uh, convention a global instrument. And uh, three ratification are still missing, but quite soon uh, all UN member states can, can come members of the convention. Uh, another important convention is uh, United Nations Water Courses Convention, Convention on the Law of the Non-Navigational Uses of International Water Courses. Uh, and this convention entered in, into force in 2014, in o last August. And um, it is based on the same principle as this UNEC Water Convention, but it is much more focused on fair and reasonable use of shared water resources. And uh, it is important to notice that uh, they are compatible and there is no contradiction between these, these uh, two conventions and um, they uh, complement each other. And there is also a very high, high political support for implementing these instruments. Um, they are seen instruments for water diplomacy, uh, for uh, conflict prevention, and uh, you, uh, United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, in 2012, uh, encourages countries outside the UNEC region to join the UNEC convention, and also stated that these uh, two conventions, their implementations uh, should go hand in hand with, the, with each other, and uh, they should be implemented in a coherent manner. 
And at the moment, there is uh, 14 parties in this UNEC conventions. But like I said, uh, this globalization uh, brings new opportunities, and uh, soon we will have a global community to deal with water issues. But what does it mean in practice? Um, Finnish-Russian Transboundary Water Cooperation um, is one of the models uh, which led to the UNEC Water Convention. Uh, we have, uh, like Natalia said, uh, more than 50 years uh, of cooperation. The agreement was signed in 1964. And we have 19 uh, common river basins between <laughs> Finland and Russia. Because this conference is focused on uh, practical tools, uh, <laughs> today I will give you a small introduction how we um, um, make uh, integrated water resources management in this area. And the area I'm talking about is uh, River Woksi, Lake Saimaa River System. And uh, in the left hand, you can see the area in Finnish side. There is a huge lake area there. And uh, downstream is this river Woksi, which flows from Finland to Russia. There are four hydropower plants in this river. Two of them are in Finnish side, and two of them are in Russian side. And um, because there is no reservoirs above all, all hydropower plants, um, it's, of course, crucial that this information exchange of, on discharges uh, uh, is um, is exchanged all the time. So these hydropower plants have a very long history of cooperation. But um, besides um, hydropower, we also have a lot of other interests in this area. And this is why we had to get some kind of instrument for uh, this integrated thinking and integrated uh, uh, management of this um, discharges of uh, in this river. And in 1991 was implemented this Lake Saima River Woksi discharge rule. And it's quite an uh, important instrument for us still. It combines the natural state of the uh, watershed with regulation. And this natural state of uh, this lake area was very important for Finland because we didn't want to have a regulated area in this uh, lake area. And um, in normal situation, if we are in this normal zone, which is uh, 50 centimeters above or below mean water level, um, the uh, discharges from Lake Saima correspond to natural flows. But uh, if there is a threat of flooding or a drought period, so uh, the forecast predict that the water level will rise above or go below this normal zone, uh, then we start uh, regulation. And um, then afterwards, when the normal situation uh, uh, is com coming again, uh, then uh, we will go back to this, this uh, normal normal situation which correspond to natural flows. And afterwards, we calculate all the losses, all the benefits. And if it's uh, uh, necessary, we compensate the possible losses. This is an example uh, of equitable and reasonable use of transboundary waters. Uh, main aim of this uh, discharge rule is to minimize adverse consequences in the river system as a whole. We take into account the hydropower, but we also take into account uh, flood risk and drought risk in this area. Uh, for uh, In drought periods, uh, for example, uh, the water traffic and uh, water supply are important. But we also take into account the environment, especially in Finland, in this Lake Saima area, there lives endangered species called Saima seal. And especially in winter time, its habitats are really important to take into account. This rule is also important for us in the future because uh, we are expecting to have much more this kind of exceptional water situations. And uh, now we have common rules how we ha can handle, handle this kind of situation and what we are going to do uh, if the flood or drought is going to be there. 
As a conclusion, some ideas for, uh, for implementation of the future sustainable development goals. Uh, I think these two water conventions are really important uh, instruments uh, for water diplomacy and conflict prevention. And I also hope that uh, uh, this transboundary cooperation will be part of the future sustainable development goals. Uh, it is, uh, of course, a challenge in many basins uh, to get both upstream and downstream countries convinced that they co both can be winners uh, if they sign agreements with their neighbors. But uh, I think that these benefits of cooperation uh, can rise above national, often short-term, interests. And uh, I think this managing transponder water resources integrated and sustainable manner is the key element to cope with future challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mina. And uh, if someone from the audience has questions, uh, you're welcome to ask them now. <laughs> if not, uh, I'm uh, quite interested actually in, uh, one, in one question, because I'm also Russian. So um, how was it uh, for you? Is it, was it easy to reach uh, an agreement uh, on the discharge rule? And uh, in general, when, it's, uh, when you need to reach a consensus on an issue, uh, how do you find uh, the way to, to reach it? How, how is, it uh, is it easy or difficult for you? Uh, making the discharge rule was really not an easy process. It took uh, almost 20 years. The initiative was made in 1973 uh, and it was implemented in 1991. So there was a lot of planning, a lot of assessments, etc. And of course, counter arguments in both countries. But I think this is important for all of you to notice that these processes can not always be so easy. Uh, but I think one uh, factor for success was this uh, stakeholder invol involvement and then, uh, of course, also this wide assessment of impact. Uh, in uh, Finnish-Russian uh, cooperation, we, we work in many different levels. Of course, we have this commission, but it has only uh, once a year meetings. Uh, but we have also regular, uh, regular working groups, and they uh, meet, meet also, and uh, organize workshops, etc. But of course, also a research institute has cooperation, um, regional authorities have cooperation, and those hydropower companies have cooperation. So in many different levels, in many different subjects, we work together. And um, uh, according to the agreement, there is a possibility that if the commission cannot reach consensus, in some uh, issue, uh, that it can submit the matter to the government. But uh, during these 50 years of cooperation, this has not happened even once. Well, thank you, it's interesting. And do you also use uh, international forums uh, as, a, as a way to, to maybe discuss some issues or reach an agreement, like for example, UNEC Water Convention, uh, the fact that uh, both Russia and Finland are parties to the convention, uh, does it help uh, in your cooperation? I think it really helps and uh, of course th those uh, uh, principles of, uh, of uh, are the same in uh, conventions and in, in our agreement that is important that we really uh, trust and uh, we have a, a common opinion on issues. But I also think that this UNEC framework gives us very many uh, ideas and uh, especially in the future when we have a global community, it's very nice to uh, get pe best practices and uh, get ideas also from other countries how we tackle, for example, climate change adaptation or this nexus concept, etc. Okay, thank you very much, Mina. Uh, if there are no questions from the audience at this point, we will still have uh, time uh, in the end of our session. And uh, if not, then I will give the floor to Luis Simas, uh, who will uh, present uh, the regional platforms, which are uh, the European Union directives and uh, the protocol on water and health to the UNEC Water Convention. Luis represents the uh, ERSAR, so independent water regulator in Portugal. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. Gracias, Natalia. Thank you very much. Um, First of all, thank you for, for the invitation to, to, to do this presentation. 
And also thank you because you helped me a lot on some of the slides, especially on the, the protocol on water and health. Um, well, um, I'm here to talk about reporting systems and, and the sustainable development goals. Um, and reporting is something that most of us don't like too much. Uh, but but uh, uh, I would like to, as a personal experience, to show you how important reporting systems can be and how important they can be to, to help us to make um, decisions in the future. Okay, those are the 17 sustainable development goals. Of course, we are going to focus our attention on number six, uh, which talks about water and sanitation. And, uh, and of course, now you know, we know that water and sanitation, they are human rights. Uh, but the question is that one, why such big difference in the world? Why something that seems so easy to achieve in some countries, in other countries, the things are so, so, so different? Why we have so very easy solutions, we know how to solve the problems, and in some countries the problems, uh, they, they, they maintain the bad quality. So we are here, we are here just to try to, to, to find the right tools to achieve a less difference between the, okay, 200 countries in the world. Of course, we are going regional. We have UNEC, uh, you can see in, in green, and then we have European Union. Uh, Portugal is part of, of, of these two uh, networks. And um, I'm going to, to, to focus the presentation on the reporting systems that are related to water. First of all, we have the, the, um, the Water Framework Directive for EU, European Union. And this Water Framework Directive that I'm not going to talk too much about because we have a presentation about river basin management and, 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 and I think it's the right one for, for going in detail. But we have a reporting system and a monitoring system that tries to assess the quality of the water bodies and uh, to maintain the good quality of the water bodies, as you can imagine, is essential to, um, to have a good environment, to have a good human protection health, and also to have a very good drinking tap water as we have here uh, today uh, in the table. And then the Water Framework Directive that is concentrated on the water bodies. bodies. We have the Drinking Water Directive concentrated on the tap water, uh, and also the Drinking Water Directive as a reporting system. Uh, it is mandatory for European Union countries. Um, you can see just uh, some documents that uh, you can find in the web about, about the reporting system. And, and this information, is, it is information uh, that um, you can use in the future to make uh, decisions. And then if you go to the UNEC, you have one tool, which is the Protocol on Water and Health, that is a more broad instrument. This instrument, as you can see, it's, the, it's probably the, the, the only one, or at least the most important one, legal treat that relates water and health, uh, which is very, very important. Water in, in, as a um, holistic approach, not only drinking water, but water as we use it from source to tap um, and, and afterwards. And of course, it, it promotes uh, a political commitment of countries to achieve a certain, uh, 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 a certain level of efficiency, a certain level of quality, a certain level of protection of environment and human health. Uh, of course, it is very related with the sustainable development goals because it also, it also has as key objects the access to drinking water for everyone and the provision for, of sanitation for everyone as you can see, it's more or less the same as the human rights to safe water and safe sanitation. Those are the countries that uh, are under the protocol on water and health, and they have some certain obligations, namely uh, an obligation of uh, defining some targets, defining some goals, and then report the, 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 the evaluation about their uh, progress. The scope of this, the protocol of water and health is very broad, as you can see. Um, it, it, 
it talks about the what we we call the urban use of water um, and with an instrument like this one uh, and with the right targets with the right goals uh, and with the right monitoring and reporting you can assess your evolution through the years if we go on detail uh, and, and we see what are the evolutions under the reporting under the protocol on water and health. Um, we have to do a, a three-year report. Um, this three-year report, uh, uh, as you can see, we uh, already have two cycles of it. Uh, the third cycle will start this year, 2015. Um, but there are some difficulties on, on, on achieving a, a good level of reporting and a good level of assessment of the progress done by the countries. The objectives of the reporting, as I have been say, saying, is to assess the progress, not really to compare the evolution between countries. It's not a competition. It's just an, a tool for the countries to understand how their solutions, how their um, uh, progress is achieved through the time. Uh, it is also, and, and, and I would like to, 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 to focus on this, it is also uh, a very good forum for sharing experience and sharing knowledge. And I think this is the most important, because it's not a competition, because it's not going to show who is in first place, second place, and third place. It's, it's, it's uh, somewhere where you can freely share your problems, share your knowledge, share your solutions, share your su successes, and share your failures. Um, Natalia uh, um, spoke in the beginning about the reporting systems. They, they should be easy uh, and they should really be connected to the sustainable development goals. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges in the future for the protocol on water and health is to connect to the sustainable development goals. Uh, um, and of course, probably we have to do some revision. One of the things that is very, uh, uh, very interesting, sometimes countries are very good on monitoring parameters, but they are not so good on understanding what are the results of those monitoring results and what they have to do with that. Because data is information. And the, the big difficulty is to read the information that data can give to you. So that's how the reporting systems can help us. I'd like to take some time, if I have, just to show you a little bit of the Portuguese experience. Um, and in this slide, you can see that in the last 10, 15 years, uh, we have doing uh, um, uh, an, an evolution on the wash sector uh, based on uh, national strategic plans that you can see there. We are on the fourth generation now, the 2014-2020. Um, and of course, because it's a national strategic plan, as a monitoring, as a reporting, as a reporting system that must be connected with the global, global goals. And some of the results you can see here. The water supply in the last 20 years, 20 years increased from 81% to 95%, the access to water. So we are going through the uh, access to all uh, to drinking water. The water quality increased in the last 20 years from 50% of safe water to 98% of safe water. So you can drink tap water nowadays in Portugal, but 20 years ago, you have to be careful. So that's one of the results of this national strategy of this monitoring and reporting systems. And you can see on the third figure, you can see the reduction of one disease that is somehow connected with the, the, the drinking water. So there, are, there is a connection between the evolutions that we do in the wash sector and the protection of the human health. You can go further and you can go to study also wastewater and surface waters and you can see the evolution here in detail uh, in the presentations that will be uploaded in the website of the conference. And also for river bathing waters, coastal bathing waters and, uh, and beaches which are very important in Portugal as you know.
So it is very important for us, these kind of national approaches that are connected with international conventions, the international approach to sustainable, sustainable development goals. So finally, I'd like to share with you four main conclusions, probably not the only ones, but four main conclusions. International instruments are driving forces, and that's one of the things, because they can be a driving force for political commitments at the national level. You can use an instru international instrument as the, 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 the solution uh, to uh, start to solve your problems. So routine monitoring is very, very important. It's very important to create uh, situations of uh, making uh, monitoring on a, a routine basis. And, of course, it is important for you to have the knowledge of that information so you can share your experience, you can learn with the others that are above you, and you can share with the others that are below you in the performance level. And, of course, the international instruments must be articulated. We must guarantee that what WHO says, UN says, uh, European Union says, UNEC says, that everything is articulated and we are not mm -hmm. monitoring and reporting a different thing for a different international instru instrument. So articulation is very, very important. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Luis, and uh, really impressive results uh, achieved at uh, the national level. You have like 100% almost uh, in all areas, so really well done. And uh, also thank you for highlighting uh, the importance of uh, good and effective and also simple uh, reporting and monitoring systems. So that's something we should work uh, towards. And uh, maybe uh, if uh, there is no like very pressing questions from the audience, maybe you could also elaborate a bit more on uh, on the role of uh, of ERSAR as a working regulator, drinking water regulator in uh, in Portugal. Yeah. Well, um, we have a very Portuguese approach on regulation of water, uh, not only uh, drinking water but also wastewater and 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 solid waste. Um, we are a, a regulator um, that um, has under the same umbrella the economic regulation, the quality of service regulation, the drinking water regulation, and the legal regulation. That may seem strange, but the thing is, and forgive me this, this, this comparison, it's, it's like a marriage. The couple at home must discuss and find the common solution. And then for the outside, they are a happy couple. And that's what we do. Every time we have conflicts between economic regulation and drinking water regulation, we discuss it at home. And then for the water sector, for the water providers, for the other stakeholders, we have one common opinion and everything think, wow, they are a very good couple. And, and that's true. It takes some discussion, but like a good marriage, it takes a lot of discussion to, to maintain it through the years. So this holistic approach of regulation, it has been a good solution in Portugal. Another thing which is quite important is independence. And the Portuguese regulator is independent. We are not submitted to the political power. We don't receive money from the national budget. Um, we don't have any connection with the politics. We just advise them. Of course, they are the ones that decide what kind of laws, but we can advise them on what the rules should be for the water sector. So, and then we can do our job completely independent of the political power. So it is very important, this independence, because give us some, some freedom to do what is right without any strange driving forces, if I may say that. Uh, thank you. And uh, uh, also, I know that uh, well, we all very well know that Portugal has been uh, very active in supporting the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights to Water and Sanitation. And um, what was uh, done concretely in Portugal, and maybe also you could uh, tell us a bit more of uh, the uh, scorecard uh, on equitable access evaluation, self-evaluation that was undertaken in Portugal. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the, the former special rapporteur was a Portuguese lady, a very strong Portuguese lady, but that was not the only reason for supporting her so actively. But um, 
indeed, we did some some work to to make the water and sanitation safe and and, and accessible to 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 everyone. Um, things like social tariffs, because we are talking about water and wastewater, and those are things that money uh, shouldn't be a constraint to people have access to. So social tariffs for those that cannot pay. Uh, the right price uh, for that. Uh, tariffs for larger families, because it's important. If we want to grow as a country, we want to promote larger families as we want to do that in Europe, uh, uh, but we have to create the conditions for that, so tariffs for larger families. And things that seem so th simple, and in Portugal was a big constraint. Mm -hmm. For instance, connection charge. You want to connect to the network. You have to pay a lot of money. So that was quite difficult for certain families. So they don't have the enough money to connect, so they didn't connect, and they use a, a, a source of water that was not so safe. So we recommend to the water sector that connection charges sh should be finished and should be diluted in the tariffs. So everyone is paying the connection for everyone. So the water is much more accessible to, to, to everyone. And finally, a very important thing is the affordability. And we have a, 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 an indicator that we assess every year that tries to guarantee that all the water providers, the water bill is less than 1% of the household income. So if it is less than 1%, no one can say that the water is expensive because we spend a lot of money in other things that are not so essential like water and sanitation. So we also uh, make the assessment of affordability. We do some sunshine regulation saying to some water providers, okay, your water is cheap or your water is expensive. Please do something about that. So those are the kind of things that, that uh, we do to, to, to achieve the, the sustainable development goals. Um, the equity scorecard allowed us um, to identify some gaps in our legislation, to identify what kind of groups were not included in, 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 in this water for everyone. And th that equity access card, um, balance scorecard, was something that we could use to uh, change the legislation and to give some recommendations to the government to, to change the legislation. Things like I, I spoke before, this uh, make, eliminating the connection charges, things that um, allow everyone to, to, to access water. And um, how, how, how to say that, uh, um, how to say that in English? Um, the, 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 this balance scorecard, this equity access, also showed us something that is very important. Everyone is speaking of what the government must do to provide something to the citizen. But there is something that, there is some other things that we should do is to uh, um, give to the citizen the idea that they have to give something back from the investment that the government is doing. So if you have a network, you have to connect. It's mandatory that you connect, but you have to create the conditions to connect. But if you don't want to connect because you just don't want, because it is affordable, it is accessible, why don't you want to connect? You, you should respond to the effort that the governments are doing to provide the right conditions. So that's something that we should also balance is the obligations of the citizens through the, gov the government and through the things that the government provides to them. Thank you very much, Luis, for your interesting you. presentation and for inspiring uh, ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and um, now we will go from, uh, so we went from global perspective to regional perspective, and now we go to a sub-regional perspective, and uh, we are traveling to Central Asia. And Iskandar Abdullayev, who is uh, executive director of the uh, Central, uh, Re Regional Center for Environment of Central Asia, will give us uh, some ideas about how cooperation, uh, uh, transboundary water cooperation has been in uh, Central Asia. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Natalia, for giving a chance to come down and scale down from the UNIC region to more uh, sub-region, which is Central Asia. 
and uh, present some uh, uh, opportunities which is uh, arriving with introduction of SDGs and uh, also role of regional cooperation in this context. I would like to give you a little bit more information about Central Asia and mainly linking it with its environment because uh, Central Asia uh, has a growing population which uh, provides some demographic pressure in the future for the economy and for environment. Uh, moreover, it has also economic uh, growth, which is quite uh, sensible uh, last few years, which means an economy will grow and economic uh, pressure on the environment and resources will also increase. Of course, uh, uh, in line with this, I would like to mention that development mode of this region is uh, resource intensive. Uh, it is very well known for developing and transition economies. And uh, moreover, the, 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 the infrastructure uh, is, requires more improvement. Institutions require more capacities and policies needs to be improved in order to uh, reduce the past dependency which these countries have. And also, a new challenges are arriving within this uh, context is like a climate change about which I would like to give you more information. All in all, uh, I think Central Asian environment has a huge anthropogenic pressure which is, uh, uh, have consequences for quality and quantities of the resources, diversity uh, and functions of environment. It is also the reduction, uh, may re reduce the river flows due to climate change, high water energy demand, it may, may be increasing the demands for water and energy. And also, uh, degraded natural biodiversity is also one of the problems Central Asia may, may face or facing already seriously. Uh, all in all, this uh, reduced economic, uh, the reduced ecosystem services uh, brings the social and economic losses. And, as, and the region is faces daily that uh, due to reduced ecosystem services, we have less job available, less food available, uh, less access to clean water and environment. Uh, but uh, also we have to be prepared in this sub-region for the new challenges such as, uh, I, as I told you, in, in the climate change. Central Asia, especially on water, uh, will be affected uh, seriously by reduction of the river flows up, uh, about 25-30%. It's a huge amount of water which may, may uh, bring um, new problems to in the water management. Moreover, it will also reduce environmental resilience, means uh, uh, less biodiversity. All in all, this requires that strong institutional capacities are needed in Central Asia. It also requires we have to build stronger social resilience in this region. Moreover, we need also uh, make sure the economic power is in place. All these uh, 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 facts, which I would like to give you in the, in the beginning, uh, uh, of course, related with uh, 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 nature of the management of the resources in the region, how it works, how it links. Uh, I think regional cooperation in this context is very important because it's prerequisite for sustainable development. First and foremost, because most of the resources, first is water, is transboundary nature. In this region, almost 80% of water resources are transboundary rivers. And also, not only resources, but also processes and, and infrastructure is also transboundary. There are many uh, rivers, canals flowing to each other, many bridges, many uh, infrastructure which is linked and transboundary nature. Therefore, we need also have to take care of this transboundary nature of uh, resources when we are talking about sustainable development goals, its implementation monitoring in the region. Moreover, it's also past dependency and common challenges may bring Central Asian countries together. It's easy to find a way and solutions if they work together. Economic growth limitations, as I, saw, uh, as I already told you, it's based on huge uh, intensive resource um, use. If we would like to overcome this limitation, we have to really uh, think of uh, bringing economic, uh, not competition, but cooperation modes in the region. Moreover, it's also social cohesion. Many uh, transboundary uh, areas are linked uh, and, and also nationality is mixed up in the region. There is not clear borders, which also requires a lot of political cooperation. In Central Asia, indeed, uh, this regional cooperation uh, has been a priority from the beginning when they got their independence after the Soviet Union. 
the regional institutions have been set up for uh, at least in the, in the first uh, priority as uh, as a water sector, which uh, and then later for sustainable development, and also international fund for saving RLC. They have a partnership memorandums and they are e indeed actively cooperating with each other. There are limitations, but there are these regional organizations set up. Moreover, lately, regional networks are strengthened, like research uh, academia networks are in place, based on organizations like Chu Talas Commission, most of you may heard and know, uh, are also working, and also environmental experts are cooperating with each other. Lately, with uh, support from international community, there are also regional working groups are set, set up, like regional working, working group on water quality, where uh, CAREG and UNEC had actively promoted regional cooperation and regional standards. This is, could be one example which can be applied also in case of sustainable development goals, implementation and monitoring. Lately, also, the shared information, environmental information systems are widely uh, used and started to be an accepted concept. Ecosystem e evaluation could be also one area where th these regional working groups also promoting the cooperation. I would say also there are regional processes led by these regional institutions like RLC basin programs. At least three basin programs already in place and implemented in different level of success, but it shows that countries of region, uh, region, regions, countries could put priorities together and underline the regional cooperation modes. Of course, its implementation and success could be assessed in different level, but it's the good mechanism which can bring the Central Asian countries together. Regional environmental goals has been also formulated uh, with uh, establishment of CAREG and implemented, um, implemented during the last 10 years. It could be also other um, uh, uh, good in, uh, instrument and process which could be uh, 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 promoted. All regional organizations uh, which I mentioned has a policy formulation functions, means uh, regional policies could be formulated, including sustainable development goals. Moreover, they also are uh, making efforts on information and awareness building in different success, but all of them almost doing it. And they have also skills and tools for monitoring and assessment of the results of the regional initiatives. In case of international initiatives like sustainable development goals, these regional institutions have capacities, monitoring tools, and other means to implement it. And moreover, all these four regional organizations have also project implementation skills, which could be used or supplied for case of sustainable development goals. If we look at the uh, last uh, uh, two decades of achievements of regional corporations, I would mention first that regional organizations still have uh, ownership. They are owned by states of the Central Asia, and most of the cases they are also funded by Central Asian countries. Of course, international support and fund is, funding is growing, but this is exactly the uh, internal processes which have, uh, uh, which have promoted this regional cooperation, but also funded. And moreover, it's internal internalization of these processes, means countries really are putting onto the table their own problems Sometimes tough problems, tough discussions, but still it's uh, owned by countries. Moreover, the rotation of governance system is very important. All four regional organizations have equal representations of five countries, and chairmanship is changed, and also ownership of the countries and hosting country is changed, which is unique, which is difficult to handle, very difficult to really manage, but it is the ownership process. And of course, lately, lastly, professionalization of this region organization slowly improving. I would say they also help to uh, continue regional dialogue. It's, uh, this regional institutions helps to continue regional dialogue processes. And it's also a platform to, for discussions. I would say we sometimes uh, have uh, information about Central Asia. There are tough discussions, water discussions, disputes, and conflicts. But I think by these regional dialogues, these conflicts always handled in peaceful manner. And uh, I would say reduction of the conflict, the role of the regional institutions. But I would also mention that, that they may also very effective short-term solutions. In case of water allocation, always at least in six months, once seasonal allocation is handled by the regional institutions. In case of SDGs and water, it could not work because we are looking longer period and longer cooperation, but at least in short-term solutions, they are very effective. At least they are regular. But uh, 
If you bring the uh, examples, I could mention that uh, um, Central Asia Initiative, uh, Water Quality Cooperation, and RLC program, which I have mentioned, could be the examples of regional cooperation. And that, that's, that has a continuity. And now, for example, now we are talking about RLC Basin Program 3. That could be uh, also the example that uh, in the region you could build uh, implementation monitoring of the sustainable development goals in phases and put really uh, 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 clear goals and implement them step by step. Now if we uh, look at the challenges of regional cooperation in the region, which I would like to also underline that there are, of course, a lot of problems with regional cooperation. Most of the regional organizations are based on sectoral focus, like only water. There is uh, no nexus uh, approach yet entered in the region. Sometimes the regional organization efforts are uncoordinated. In, it could be repeated. In one platform, you discuss the same issues twice. Longer process of negotiations and decision making is much more complicated. Also, regional processes need renewal. It's still uh, not reflecting the today's needs. And we're not talking about in Central Asia SDGs. Rather, we're talking about daily problems between the uh, riparian countries. And they are most of the time unlinked from na national priorities. And sometimes we just uh, bring to the regional level very small issues, not uh, issues which are, are, are the priorities. And of course, it's also dislinked from global development. And rarely uh, you can have uh, information that regional organization talked about SDGs. That could be the, also the, uh, the in, uh, in, in intervention from, from, from us to improve it. And regional cooperation sometimes ad hoc, context-based, and conflictive, and less result. However, I would say uh, we have to appreciate the ownership of the process by the regional countries. And they kept this uh, 20 years, these uh, regional institutions. And I would say uh, new efforts uh, renewed by EU strategy for Central Asia, for example, have been very good uh, support, enhancing uh, support to regional joint activities, and they were helpful to strengthening regional cooperation and also coordination of EU and regional efforts. I would say that's also one of the kickstart for the regional cooperation. I would say also uh, there are a few other more initiatives which could uh, support uh, regional cooperation and strengthen and address these weaknesses which I have underlined. That could be new Silk Road initiative, it could be Berlin process which is uh, related with water, and also regional organizations themselves are uh, making some efforts. I would mention last Urgench conference in Uzbekistan of ECIFAS could be really uh, gives a hope of renewed efforts of the cooperation in the regional level. And also the, uh, uh, the Sustainable Development Commission and Water Commission are also trying to improve regularity of their meetings and outcomes. I would say also we are planning to have a meeting of regional organization, organizations soon in, in 2015 in order to really technically improve cooperation between these regional institutions. I would uh, say uh, that regional organizations and processes cooperation will improve because the economy and security of the region will drive this cooperation. There is no way. Uh, it's common challenge. It will be uh, also a gain for all countries. And I would say that also consolidation uh, will happen in regional institutions, like uh, they will uh, consolidate processes and cooperation modes improved and information system will be improved. But there is also danger that there may be uh, some disintegration, uh, reduced cooperation. There is alternative uh, scenario that no or few regional initiatives will, will, uh, will go, go on. But if I, today we come back to our more of uh, subject of today's conference, SDGs. And I would say on SDGs, before we shift to the SDGs, we looked at MDGs. And in Millennium Development Goals, Central Asian countries have been quite successful on access to drinking water. And the latest data shows that uh, in all countries, the access improved uh, tremendously, in, in comparison with, uh, for example, uh, 90s. And especially the last five years increase is, 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 is not slow. However, we have to work on sanitation. That could be the one area in Central Asia needs more, more, more efforts. If we look at the SDGs, I think uh, Central Asia's representation in setting post-2015 could be improved uh, via regional uh, institutions. Unfortunately, uh, that passiveness is, is mentionable. I, I would say there was only a few, uh, uh, few 
cases where the, that could be mentioned that Central Asians have put together some uh, comments on SDGs or made efforts to, 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 to take care of Central Asian specificities. However, uh, it's SDGs implementation is interest for Central Asian countries because for their prosperity, security, and sustainability is key, especially regional elements, as I told, because of the transboundary nature of the resources. And successful implementation uh, requires system of monitoring. I think we need to indicators which are accepted by countries uh, of the region. Information management and exchange of the information data is key for uh, a successful implementation of the SDGs. What we could do at the regional level uh, uh, for the accountability mechanism of the uh, SDGs, the regional level we could facilitate exchange of best practices and lessons learned because five countries still very different and still has a different experience and different economic level and social levels. So I think that could be good level to learning from each other, not learning from uh, only international experience. Also, the solutions uh, to share challenges and transboundary issues is very important. Moreover, uh, we need also inputs uh, from the reviews of the global level back to the regional level. What is other countries achieving and how Central Asia c can gain from this? And we could also translate these global goals into policies, guidelines, and recommendations at the, uh, at the national level, standards. We could mobilize partnerships at the regional level. That's very important. Civil society, uh, economic uh, sector, business, and also a state could cooperate very well with each other for SDGs implementation and monitoring. We could also build ownership and understanding. We have to really make sure that ownership is in place because without the clear ownership, uh, there will be no regional cooperation. So what we could also uh, do is, uh, uh, or we are doing a promotion of set of indicators like says for monitoring of the SDGs implementation. I think that's very important. There must be the accepted indicators which can be comparable with countries. We use uh, advanced reporting approach. Uh, we could improve the public access to the information like Aarhus centers, uh, their crucial role on uh, passing the information. In this uh, case, I would say Central Asian regional organizations could uh, gain the methodological support, looking to the support from UNEC institutions, other UN institutions on methodological support, data and reporting requirements, application or, and use of SAIS, and also the capacity building could be successful element of the SDG implementation and monitoring in Central Asia. All in all, I think Central Asian regional cooperation is the key for implementation and monitoring of the sustainable development goals in the region. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Iskandaria, for this very comprehensive presentation of uh, regional initiatives uh, in Central Asia and uh, indeed having been to the region. Um, I hope as many of you also have, have been there. You, you understand how really important it is to set up cooperation frameworks, even if the processes are long, uh, challenging, and uh, even um, getting people together at the table, it's uh, usually a challenge. So um, we really congratulate uh, Central Asia on these uh, many initiatives that you just mentioned. And uh, just uh, maybe one question, because we are running out of time. Uh, you kindly presented us all the tools uh, and how the SDGs can be um, implemented in Central Asia and how Central Asian regional initiatives could uh, support implementation of SDGs. But maybe what would be the support that you would need from international community or what, what, are, you, um, what are you going to ask from these global processes in order to ensure that the countries of Central Asia are developing in a, in a sustainable way? Yeah, I think the Already uh, partly I addressed uh, this question in my presentation. One is support the setting up regional di dialogues. I think that's really important, as you already mentioned, the bringing the uh, different groups, regional elites, regional <coughs> organizations together. Uh, then uh, also, I would say the changing knowledge and, and, and inform instruments, which uh, other parts of the UNEC and uh, wide uh, the global community is having, because that's the bridge, uh, knowledge bridge, and uh, is very important for the region. The region is, is sometimes locked due to language, due to experience uh, 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 from, the, from the global achievements. I would say that's the second thing. And third thing is also a platforms, which I, I already informed that few 
uh, international initiatives um, having in, in, in Central Asia, much more focused supporting the not only criticizing the Central Asians not being able to cooperate, but supporting what they have achieved. I would say this is, the, this is sufficient for having a good, uh, successful results in the region on sustainable development. Okay, thank you very much, Iskandar. Uh, if there are no questions, we go now to the most international uh, river basin, <laughs> and uh, Raymond May from uh, uh, from the International Commission for the Protection of uh, River Danube will present uh, uh, how the cooperation is established in the basin and uh, particularly the nexus approach. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you, yes. Buenos dias, good morning. To everybody, thank you, Natalia, for giving me the floor. Um, I will talk about the work which is ongoing in the Danube River Basin on river basin management and also on intersectoral cooperation, how we are approaching the nexus topic. Um, but first, I would quickly like to start with this overview slide, World's International River Basins. Um, it was mentioned several times already today that water is a transboundary issue. I think it is very important to mention this. Water is crossing boundaries. Almost two thirds of the global land mass is covered by international river basins. Uh, I think it's quite logic that there's uh, really a need for cooperation between countries to manage uh, this key resource, this really important uh, resource for the benefit uh, of the people. On the other hand, uh, it's not only about cooperation across boundaries between countries, it's also about uh, cooperation across boundaries between different sectors. And this is very much in the heart of the whole um, Nexus discussion. Water, water is an interdisciplinary and cross-cutting issue. We have got different sectors linked with water. We have got drinking water, what we heard already today. Uh, industries, we have got uh, the whole navigation hydropower topic, so infrastructure development connected with it, flood risk management, uh, agriculture and food production. And I think this is very important to be kept in mind also when we talk about um, the sustainable development goals. As we all know, Goal six is on water. It's to ensure the availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. I think it's very important. It's really crucial to have a topic uh, or a goal specifically on water. We've got also sub goals um, related to water, so 6.1 to 6.6, .6, uh, which is going more in into detail, for instance, on drinking water, on sanitation, on ecosystems. And the topic 6.5 is also on integrated water resource management. Uh, at all levels, including through transboundary cooperation as appropriate is written there. We might discuss what as appropriate uh, might mean in this context. Maybe some countries still have the perception that the risk to join agreements is still higher than the benefits which can be gained out of it. So maybe this is really a topic where maybe further work in the future is still needed to um, address this, this issue maybe. Um, however, the point I want to make with this slide is that although we have a specific goal on water, a lot of other goals are connected to the goal on water. For instance, food security, goal two, is, 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 is central also, and the key element also related to the water topic. Uh, goal seven, sustainable energy, uh, is also very much related. Um, then other goals as well, like climate change adaptation, uh, the marine ecosystem, uh, or also the whole biodiversity discussion. So all these topics are related to water, so it's very important to have really water in the center of um, these discussions also, linked with the other topics. Um, with this brief introduction, I would like to now shift to the Danube and explain a little bit uh, our approaches, how we try to address uh, this complex um, issue. As Natalia already mentioned, um, the Danube um, is the most international river basin in the world with 19 uh, countries in the basin, sharing the basin. Um, water cooperation is based on the Danube River Protection Convention from the year 1994. So there was really a window of opportunity for negotiating this uh, agreement, the Danube River Protection Convention, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, because the Danube Basin is spanning from Central uh, Europe to Southeastern Europe, so really across the former Iron Curtain. And in the beginning of the 90s, there was really this opportunity to bring countries together and to negotiate the agreement, which was finally agreed in 94 and came into force in 1998. And the cooperation in the Basin is based on this legal framework. Contracting parties are 14 countries with a major share in the basin, plus the European Union. It's divided between nine new member states and five non-new member states. And very important to mention also the ICBDR is the platform for countries to draft 
and adopt the Danube River Basin Management Plan and the Danube Flood Risk Management Plans according to the EU Water Framework Directive and the EU Floods Directive. So in practice, these are really the key tools for the practical work the Danube River Basin Commission is doing. Uh, maybe just to very briefly outline the content of both of these directives. The Water Framework Directive is basically promoting integrated or requiring integrated water resource management on the basin-wide scale. So when you have got an international river basin, it re requires cooperation between the countries. Uh, it requires assessments of all pressures and uses related to water. It requires monitoring. It requires setting up um, um, joint program of measures or program of measures which are implemented. And this whole process is repeated um, every six years. So although the Water Framework Directive itself might be quite a complex tool of legislation, I think the basic principles are applicable all, all over the world, I think because it's about getting your pressures uh, on the table, discussing your pressures, doing proper assessments, getting uh, information what the status of the water is, and then agreeing on measures in order to improve water status and to balance the different water uses. There's an evolving uh, management cycle. Every six years, this process is uh, repeated. The first management plans were adopted for the Danube Basin in 2009. So we are currently in the end of the implementation of the first joint program of measures. And we are currently already, we developed a second Danube River Basin Management Plan, a draft which is currently under public consultation and which will be finalized by the end of um, this year. Similar approaches are in place for the Floods Directive, uh, which came into force in 2007. And currently also we are uh, in the process of elaborating the first Flood Risk Management Plan, which is following the same deadlines like uh, the Water Framework Directive. Very important to mention also, basically both directives require an integrated approach with stakeholder involvement. And you might ask yourself why stakeholder involvement, why intersectoral cooperation? I think, just name it, I think there are a lot of examples around uh, the world where we see that water can be potentially a conflicting topic between different stakeholders between countries. I just picked out one example from our basin from the 80s, where there was in one country a heavy discussion on the planned hydropower station, which caused a huge political dispute in the country. Um, finally, agreement was not to build it, but this uh, area is now a national park. This is just one example. Um, but we have got other examples as well in place where we see that um, discussing this potential conflicting topic from the very beginning uh, in the very open process is maybe a better way to deal with it. Um, it might be easier to take a unilateral decision for decision makers. So it might be the case that you come quicker to a decision but we also see we have got many examples where the implementation process can be quite uh, difficult when a lot of resistance is there. So with intersectoral cooperation, maybe the decision-making process might be challenging, the discussions might be challenging, but in the end, the implementation process uh, can be much quicker and in the end, you can gain really from this intersectoral cooperation and getting really a better balance with regard to different uh, water users. That's the theory. Um, <laughs> what are we trying to do to address this in the basin? Uh, on this slide, you see uh, a quick overview on our different expert bodies, which were established in the frame of the ICPDR, the Danube Commission. As I mentioned, water is a complex topic, so we have got a lot of expert groups which are addressing different issues. For instance, we have got expert groups on pollution reduction, on monitoring, on groundwater, hydromorphology, um, economics, nutrient pollution, etc. And um, all these groups are working on specific topics and we are very decentralized organized. That means in all of these expert groups, we have got representatives from the countries, from our 14 countries. But in addition, we have got a very strong participation of stakeholder representatives. We have got around um, 23 observer organizations, um, including representatives, for instance, from the navigation sector, from the hydropower sector, um, from the dredging associations, from researchers, WWF, Global Water Partnership, and uh, all these stakeholders and interest groups are directly participating around the same table with the country representatives. And we really try to have an as open process as possible. So people can bring in pr uh, proposals for changing text of the management plans, bring up issues, put issues on the agenda. And uh, we really believe, strongly believe that we gain tremendously from this very open process because in the end the product is much better, uh, which we are delivering. This is the general approach, how we are working. Um, but we have seen that for specific topics, dedicated activities are very important also to be done. Um, because we have seen that, for instance, specifically with regard to inland navigation and with regard to hydropower, 
there's quite a potential for conflict also with regard to different projects in the basin. So a couple of years ago, we launched targeted, targeted activities, um, asking us the question, how to ensure the sustainable water protection, non-deterioration of the water bodies and nature protection sites if these infrastructure projects will be implemented, how to make a step from confrontation to reconciliation, cooperation, and maybe in some cases to create even win-win solutions, and can we guide infrastructure development that it won't conflict with existing environmental legal requirements. Um, a first response was in 2007 when we launched a cross-sectoral dialogue with the inland navigation sector. I have to mention maybe that uh, there's the Danube River Basin Commission in place, I'm representing, but there's another commission dealing specifically with navigation, and there's a sub-basin commission for the Sava River Basin, which is dealing with both topics. And um, we brought these people from these different commissions together, also representatives from the environmental ministries, business representatives, uh, economic ministries, and started this cross-sectoral dialogue um, asking us the question how to ensure the sustainability of these infrastructure um, projects. And the result was the joint statement and inland navigation um, and the environment, which was agreed by all these actors and which basically promotes a civilized uh, and structured approach with regard to the discussions for infrastructure projects, taking the different objectives on board from the very beginning. We've got follow-up activities ongoing. Yearly, we organize meetings to keep the people involved and to also have an exchange on the progress in the implementation of this document. And um, this was, I would say, a very successful activity, leading me now to hydropower, which is another potential conflicting uh, topic. I think everybody agrees there's a clear need to increase the share of renewable energy, specifically we think when we think about climate change uh, mitigation policies. Um, on the other hand, it's also clear that hydropower can have negative impacts on on the environment can also in some regions have negative social impacts. And here again, um, based on the previous experiences with cross-sectoral cooperation, we launched an activity bringing the different uh, actors together. This activity was based on a mandate which we received from the ministers of the Danube countries in 2010. So in 2011, we launched this process, built up a working group with the different representatives. And it was a very tough discussion, taking around two years. But finally, we managed to get an agreement on the guiding principles on sustainable hydropower development in the Danube Basin, uh, which was finalized and adopted in 2013, um, and which was agreed by, first of all, the countries, but also uh, NGOs, stakeholder representatives from the International Hydropower Association, European Small Hydropower Association. And currently, this document is also under, application, under practical application in the basin. Um, just very briefly, what's the main content? Um, it's dealing with the question how to deal with existing hydropower, but the core element is the strategic planning approach for new hydropower development. We develop different criteria for the evaluation of the appropriateness of river stretches for hydropower use. And um, I will not go into detail, but more details can be uh, obtained from the document itself. I think what is important to be mentioned is what we try to communicate are the range of benefits which can be gained for the different uh, sectors, let's say. For the energy sector, applying these guiding principles can bring the benefit to have a streamlined authorization process, an improvement of the predictability and upfront, upfront information where the authorization for new projects is likely. For the environmental sector, transparency and involvement in decision making, and also the protection of very sensitive river stretches. And for authorities, an increase of the security for legal compliance because it's about proper implementation also of EU legislation and um, getting an involvement of relevant actors in an early stage and an accelerated implementation of legislation. So really an accelerated increase of renewable energy, but also, um, also uh, a protection of sensitive river stretches. Let's put it that way. These were very targeted activities. What we are currently doing is also, and what I would like to briefly mention is, also sustainable flood risk management, where we are launching now also the activities to really link flood risk management and the flood risk planning closely with river basin management. Again, we bring the different actors together to create a common understanding also on the topic. And one potential topic for the coming years, where we are discussing now whether we want to go more into detail on this, is also sustainable agriculture. And coming now to my nearly final slide, because I think it's important also when we talk about the sustainable development goals, um, that we think about river basins and the connection also to the marine environment. I think there's a very close connection. 
In Europe, currently, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive is under implementation, also including elements where the marine ecosystem uh, needs to be linked also with river basin management activities because a lot of pollution is coming from river basins. We have got migratory fish species also, which are living both in the freshwater systems but also in the seas, so it's very important to link these two activities again. I put an example for the Black Sea, uh, which is the receiving sea for the Danube, actually. And uh, you see on this picture the situation in 1979 with regard to the chlorophyll A um, concentrations in the northwestern shelf of the Black Sea. Uh, this is related to nutrient pollution and algae blooms. So in the meantime, in the last um, decades, the dead zone, which was still in place in the 70s, um, so the anoxygen uh, zone in the northwestern shelf of the Black Sea, has been virtually eliminated. Um, oxygen levels are near saturation in the meantime in most areas. And also the number of benthic species increased uh, significantly in the meantime. So we clearly see that a lot of progress was made, which is on one hand related to uh, investments on urban wastewater treatment, but also economic circumstances, which changed a lot during this, this, this period. But we, the key message is think about the river basin management also in terms of the receiving seas and try to link these activities as well. Coming now to my final slide, the conclusions. Um, just to mention again, two-thirds of the global land mass is covered by transboundary river basin, making water a transboundary issue. Um, but it's also a cross-cutting issue between sectors, so the water nexus topic, uh, requiring intersectoral cooperation. We see, based on our experience, that the establishment, uh, it, or like the intersectoral exchange, allows for the establishment of possibilities for formal but also informal exchange. What is very important, in some of our meetings, national representatives from different sectors met themselves the first time, what was quite interesting for us to see, but this really improved also their cooperation and back at home at the national level. Um, it really helps to create a better common understanding on the requirements and constraints also different sectors are confronted with. Um, it allows an integration for potential conflicting objectives from the beginning, and also it allows for an acceleration of the implementation of relevant legislation. Based on this also, um, I think integrated transboundary river basin management is really a prerequisite for achieving different sustainable development goals. For instance, also on water supply, because it's about water quality also, the water supply topic, and sanitation, health, food, energy um, systems, ecosystems, marine environment, and also climate change, because water is really in the center of the whole climate change debate. So also in this terms, it's very important to get your river basin management right. Um, Transboundary river basin management is also an important catalyst for triggering related national discussions and processes. Quite often we see that at national level discussions are locked and with an international debate this allows for more room for real exchange again and for progress also in the debates at the national level. But it also requires something. It requires a legal or institutional framework for transboundary cooperation and also to provide the required resources for running such institutions like the Danube Commission. Um, and also, and this is really a key element, it requires political support and dedication of the relevant actors which are involved in such uh, cooperation activities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Raymond. And um, again, we hear how advanced the uh, Danube Basin is, and uh, it's always a pleasure to hear how much has been uh, done already and uh, how maybe other basins of the world could, could learn from the Danube Basin. Uh, but maybe uh, still about uh, cooperation, uh, you mentioned that it's, it's quite interesting because uh, most of the countries are parts of the European Union, but some are not. And so has this cooperation been uh, challenging or if not, uh, how did you uh, manage to, to get all these countries together even if their level of economic development or, or political structures are very different? Yeah, it's, it's true. It's, when you look at the Danube Basin, it's a very heterogeneous basin in terms of the socioeconomic circumstances. We've got some of the richest countries of Europe in our basin, but also some of the poorest countries. So it's really a challenge to, to bridge also this socioeconomic um, gap. Um, I think we are in, the, uh, in, in practical terms, the legal framework for cooperation is the convention, but in practical terms, the Water Framework Directive and Floods Directive are the key tools because you have got straightforward deadlines and requirements included. Uh, it's a legal requirement for you member states. So when they are applying the Water Framework Directive principles, at the same time, they are uh, actually fulfilling the requirements of the convention for you member states. For non-EU member states, it's the case that most of the countries in our basin, or all of them basically, have a new perspective. 
So cooperating in the frame of the ICPDR helps them to accelerate the process of coming closer to European Union accession. Um, but not, not only this is a, a benefit for them to cooperate, um, also the basic principles which are applied um, are helpful to create benefits for, for, for them at home also. Um, so the different benefits, and this is one reason, and the cooperation basically on the Water Framework Directive is also based on a political agreement also from non-EU member states to work on the implementation um, of the directive. For the a little bit socioeconomic uh, more challenged countries, we also try to get additional resources on board to help them actually coming to the same level like uh, other countries which are in a far advanced state maybe already. So we really try to bridge a little bit this gap also with with the cooperation, actually it also helps them to obtain external resources also for the activities which they're doing, for instance, from different donor organizations like World Bank, UNDP, Jeff, and so on, different projects also financed to bring them closer to, to standards other countries might already have. So do I understand correctly that you also make use of global platforms and global processes to, to make sure that this cooperation is effective at the basin level? Like for example, maybe the UNEC Water Convention, or as you mentioned, some projects by UNDP and World Bank, like bigger organizations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you look at the history of the, of the organization, for kicking off the cooperation, there was a lot of uh, UN funding uh, applied. So we had big projects which allowed to do first assessments to establish the information exchange platform, to establish the secretariats, to get countries on board in the different expert groups. But in the meantime, we are in the lucky situation that um, all the countries are Actually, the organization is running with the contributions from the countries itself. So we are independent from external sources. I think what is really an important progress, it makes, it's really the country's organization. They pay the contributions, and based on these contributions, the activities are ongoing. Um, basically, all countries, uh, it's an, there's an agreement that all pay the same contribution, but we have got some transition phases. So countries which are more challenged with regard to their socioeconomic conditions are paying still less, but in the midterm, the objective is that the, com that the contributions um, are the same. We are also strongly involved in US UNEC activities, for instance, uh, because we also feel we have a commitment to give something back to the global community because we received a lot from the global community. And, um, and therefore, we really try to be involved also in, in different activities on, on, on the global level also as well. Thank you. And uh, also on these uh, two very interesting um, initiatives that you had on uh, inland navigation and uh, hydropower, uh, you mentioned uh, in particular for hydropower uh, that uh, these guidelines were uh, adopted in 2013. Uh, and was already, uh, like, it, did, did the implementation start and did you already have cases? For example, we know that there are some initiatives uh, in the Danube Basin with uh, hydropower production. Do you think that these guidelines, uh, the existence of these guidelines will ease the process of agreement at basin level or how do you see the real implementation of the guidelines? Yeah. Well, the application of the guiding principle is currently ongoing. What we are doing is like having a similar approach like with Finland navigation. We are organizing now yearly meetings and workshops where countries are also reporting the progress they made in the practical application. But really the, the core idea, the core element was um, to really help to get projects in the right places on track, but also the protection of other stretches where, um, where maybe um, the gain you can get from hydropower electricity is maybe not balancing the environmental impacts also. So um, what we also see that is that uh, the whole initiative was based also from communication from the countries actually. This was not a top-down thing, but countries said, well, we are really in a, in a difficult situation because on one hand there's a strong pressure to increase renewable energy, to increase hydropower. On the other hand, we have got existing environmental legislation in place. So how can we ensure that, um, that the legal requirements are actually met and how can we bring this into a balance? So um, this document and the practical application really helps them to get, to get these issues right, to get the right balance, to get involvement also at the national level of stakeholders and finally to accelerate also the implementation process. We gained also from experience from other countries uh, where we see that for some projects the discussions were stuck for 10, 15 years and after such a strategic planning approach was applied, um, the problems could be solved. So this is really, we try to be as practical as possible with this document and to gain really also from outside experience uh, to get these things uh, in a very practical way also on track. Okay, thank you so much, Raymond, uh, for your presentation. And uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one interested in uh, more details uh, about the topics that were presented today. Um, maybe someone from the audience? Yes.
thank you. My name is Barbara Anton. I'm here from ICLE Local Governments for Sustainability. And I, I would be interested to better understand the role of cities of local governments in river basin uh, management. Obviously, your first uh, sort of um, target group is always national governments and their policies. But then, I mean, the performance of river basin management would always very much depend on what your cities, especially the big cities, are doing and how they are dealing with their open water management in the watershed. So how, how do you involve them and, and yeah, how does it work in practice? Yes, thank you. I think the question is targeting the integration of different levels of management. Um, when, when you look at, the, at our cooperation, it's based like on the pyramid system. So on the basin wide level, um, the main addresses are of course the national governments. Um, but on the basin wide level, we're not dealing with every little creek and every little river. It's, it's like on the big issues, on the major issues on the basin wide level. Uh, and also in the major rivers and groundwater bodies and also coastal waters. So I, I see um, in this process a major role of the national representatives because on one hand they have got the international perspective via our international working groups, but on the other hand there's more detailed planning ongoing at the national level. So on one hand we have got the basin-wide Danube River Basin Management Plan and now also very soon adopted the first Danube Basin-wide Flood Risk Management Plan. On the other hand, you have got more detailed planning ongoing at national level. So you have got very detailed national management plan for Germany, for instance, for Hungary, for Romania. And even on the sub-basin level, then you have got even more detailed management plans. For instance, in Romania, you have got, in addition, 11 sub-basin management plans. And the challenge is the communication exchange between these different uh, levels um, of management. Um, I think it, it's, it's not useful at all that at the international basin-wide level we're dealing with the very local issue. This is something that has to be solved at the national level and this communication exchange has to be really ensured at the national level. So they've got a very specific role there. On, not only in terms of communicating to the international level what the national issues are or the local issues are, but also bringing back home from our international meetings and working rooms the basin-wide issues and to promote activities which are necessary to achieve basin-wide objectives. One example, for instance, the reduction of nutrient pollution, which is entering into the Black Sea. Some countries might already have solved at the national level um, and on, on the regional level, also on the local level, the issue of uh, water pollution because billions were invested in the last decades on wastewater treatment plants. However, still further efforts are needed in order to uh, get the status of the Black Sea right. And this is an international topic uh, where from these international working groups, uh, like um, this has to be communicated at home to even improve the efforts at home, although national problems or local problems might have been solved already. So it's a communication challenge, um, but um, just to mention like the national level has a certain strong role in this communication challenge, I would say. <coughs> We have got, um, on the international level, we have got, as I mentioned, 23 observer organizations which are participating. However, um, we also, when our management plans are elaborated, we have got a public consultation uh, phase ongoing as well. So currently, in December 2014, now just very recently, we adopted the draft plans. And what is now ongoing is the public consultation phase on different levels again, at international level. So everybody, local community, can provide comments to our international plan. And this actually happened also. We get sometimes comments from very local stakeholders, from local NGOs, for instance, which send their comments to the national level, but also international level. And we make all the comments transparent, which we receive, and we address them in our expert group. So um, stakeholders and also local communities have the possibility to provide comments at the international level, also at the national level. And we are dealing with this in a very open and transparent way. Make those com comments public and also discuss them you know, expert groups with uh, NGO representatives, stakeholder representatives, etc. They also make public then the comments uh, will be made public in July this year on our website again. And we also, the results of the discussions on the different comments are also made public on our website uh, to make the whole process very transparent and open. Okay. Don't look convinced. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that you in, um, involve 
local people, of NGOs, and so on. I'm interested in yeah. this government issue. <laughs> The governments uh, itself, for instance, we have got federal states also in the basin, where we have got provincial governments also, and they are involved by the national processes. Uh, so it depends. For some countries, we have got national representatives and also representatives of the provincial and local governments for, for uh, federal states. This is the case for Germany, for instance, also for Austria, which are very, uh, in a federal way, organized, and we have got quite often, it's the same at EU level, um, quite often two representatives are going to EU uh, meetings, and national representatives plus one representative from the from the um, provincial governments, for instance, communi communicating the results of these meetings as well. Thank you for your question, and I'm sure Raymond now knows how important it is to <laughs> involve <laughs> local <it>. governments. <laughs> uh, you also had a question, please. Yeah, just uh, maybe this last question. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm Alizian from Arkham Foundation Syria. I would like to ask Mr. Uh, Abdullah about uh, Aral Sea disaster mitigation. Aral Sea disaster yeah, I understand. and I how think you very it. shortly, briefly, yeah. there was the, the last Urgent, conf Urgent conference where I uh, just referred during my presentation was a big uh, um, gathering of uh, international and also the regional and national partners. They have shaped these uh, plans. It's ACBP3, RLC Basin Program 3. Details I could tell you about uh, in the efforts are ongoing. Thank you. OK, I, I see that the organizers uh, hint to us that uh, we, our session is over. But uh, I just would like to thank uh, a lot to all of uh, our panelists who really made uh, great presentations. And I'm sure that uh, you can address uh, your questions to them uh, in the coming days uh, during reception and the free time. And just maybe in one word, I, I think what I most heard during this uh, session was the word cooperation. Cooperation at really different levels uh, between countries, between regions, uh, at country level, between sectors, and even between minister, ministries maybe at country level. So I think this is uh, something that we can maybe take from uh, this session is uh, that how cooperation is important and how we can really make it uh, happen even more uh, in the coming years. Thank you very much to all. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you. We will continue now with the um, session on security for Asia and the Pacific.